Today we're going to be talking about bunions. So this is a common problem that a lot of people face that causes them pain and gets in the way of them enjoying their you know, meaningful activity and exercise. So what can you do about it? And we're going to discuss how footwear may or may not be part of the prevention and part of the solution as well. So does wearing minimal footwear or you know, ditching the high heels and wearing barefoot types of uh, footwear, does that make a difference? This is a viewer request. So you know who you are. I hope you like this episode. I hope you find this helpful. Um, thank you for watching. Let's dive into the research. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Anthony Davis with Shapeshift Wellness. This is a channel that uses evidence and research to explore how you can take your health into your own hands. Um, I hope you enjoy today's episode. This comes from a viewer request. If you have requests, leave them in the comments. And today, stick around to the end of the video because that's when I'm going to discuss my personal recommendations based on the research on how you might be able to manage uh, you know, your footwear and exercise, etc., as it relates to bunions. A a quick note about terminology. Bunions are the same thing as hallux valgus. So um, yes, there's a technical difference. This is more of a bump and this is more of a clinical thing with pain, uh, but essentially they're interchangeable. I'm going to use them to mean the same thing. Um, hallux means your big toe and valgus just means it's angled inward. Okay. So all that means if you have bunions is that your toe is angled inward. So let's look at it. Here's the anatomy. Here's your big toe and it is angled inward, right? That's all it is, is there's a little bit of an angle. And then this part, this joint here kind of sticks out a little bit and it might rub against some stuff and cause some irritation. It's not a huge deal necessarily, but if it causes pain, then that can be a big deal for you personally, if that applies to you. So how do we perhaps prevent this? And if you already have bunions, how do you perhaps manage this to lead a more healthy, happy, functional, pain-free life? Let's find out. So does footwear have anything to do with it? Well, the premise makes sense, right? We have feet that are shaped kind of, you know, with, you know, wider at the toes. And then we have shoes for some reason that are shaped, they go out and then they curve inward and they kind of have points at the ends of the shoes. And if we tried to take this um, foot and put it on top of this shoe, you can see that it does not fit. So we are trying to take our feet and putting them in shoes that are not foot shaped. And then we end up with feet over here that are shoe shaped. So why would we want feet that are shoe shaped instead of just designing shoes that are foot shaped? It doesn't make sense. And so the, the premise is that by sticking our feet into these funny shaped shoes for the sake of fashion, that we are then creating feet that are dysfunctional. Is that true? Let's see what the research says. So this was a survey study. We were looking at women over 50 years old, and we wanted to see what kind of footwear they wore over the course of their life to see if maybe uh, people who tended to wear more high heels and, um, and, and pointy toed shoes, if they perhaps had more um, bunions than people who did not wear those pointy toed shoes with high heels. So uh, again, we've got women's footwear encompassing, you know, two main design features. We've got the elevated heel and a constrictive toe box. So uh, by the way, a quick note, modern footwear Footwear has retained vestiges of these early fashion influences, many of which may be associated with foot pain and deformity. So the idea here is that with high heels and pointy toed, that we are going to cause problems for your feet. Now, when we did the, um, by the way, some previous studies have shown that the elevated heel is associated with bunions, uh, hallux valgus, and that a constrictive toe box is also associated with bunions. So this study was looking at more of a long-term survey. And what we uh, did was asked women, uh, women exclusively, by the way, 
we were asking them, hey, throughout your life in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, etc., what kinds of shoes were you wearing predominantly? Were you wearing a wide toed uh, shoe or a pointy toed shoe? Were you wearing a sort of flat heel or were you wearing a high heel? So what they found was when we looked at the study, by the way, we were looking at 2,627 women between the ages of 50 and 89. We excluded men from the study. Uh, we just were looking at women. And what we found is that in the early stages of their lives, uh, women tended to wear high heels. And then as they aged, they did not wear high heels nearly as often. Same thing with a toe box that they um, tended to wear, you know, a lot more of a narrow, a pointy toed shoe in their younger years. And then as they age, they stopped wearing those shoes, that they started to value practicality and comfort over fashion as they aged. And um, interestingly, what we found, we looked at pain and we looked at the formation of bunions, and we found this particular study found no association between um, foot pain and foot wear. However, we could not track um, you know, their pain obviously throughout their years. This is a very hard thing to measure in a retrospective study like this. Um, there were a bunch of other studies that this article mentioned that did find a strong association between foot pain and um, bunions uh, and footwear. And so, you know, I don't know, the jury's kind of out there. It's not like a conclusive thing. There does seem to be some association, but not the, in this particular study. The main thing that this particular study did find was that the key public health implication of our study is that avoiding constrictive footwear, particularly when you're younger, between the ages of 20 and 29, may contribute, may contribute to the prevention of hallux valgus. Now, when I say prevention, I really mean risk reduction. What they found, I believe it was 18 out of 100. I believe that they predicted, this is off the top of my head, I don't have the uh, data in front of me, but the I believe they predicted that if all of these women had been wearing um, uh, wide-toed, uh, flat-heeled shoes, zero-drop dro shoes, then 18 out of 100 of them would have successfully prevented the formation of bunions. So it isn't going to work for everybody. This study predicted that it would potentially help some people. So if you are young and you're wondering about footwear, um, yeah, maybe it does make sense for you to wear more of a, a natural, comfortable, wide, -toed uh, wide toe box shoe that allows your feet to just kind of splay out and do their natural thing rather than jamming them into high-heeled, pointy-toed shoes. A lot of people are forming the conclusion, therefore, that you should be walking and running barefoot, that you should go buy the barefoot shoes. So here are these barefoot shoes, these, you know, Vibram five fingered shoes. I've been wearing those for 10 years. I love them. You know, Vivo barefoot, great brand. And you notice the wide toe box, right? So your feet, your toes can actually fit in there and kind of splay out and do their natural thing. You see that you can fold the shoe up on itself, very minimal, no support. Your foot has to do all the work. As a result of wearing these, your feet are going to get super strong. But what does the research say? Do we have research on minimal shoes? Well, yes, but we don't have nearly enough. So here's a pilot study. This is a little itty bitty study. Um, I think it was like 16 people or 18 people or something like that. And they were, they actually gave them um, these shoes, uh, not this exact model, but they gave them Vibram five finger shoes and they had them uh, use them for barefoot running for three months. And they wanted to see, does barefoot running change their bunions? Does it actually decrease the angle of their bunions? Um, as well as a bunch of other factors that I'm not gonna get into because they have to do with force production and biomechanics and stuff, it doesn't matter. We, let's look at the bunions. That's the most important thing for today's video. and. Um, what they found was that here we go, you know, here's pre, here's post. Oh man, I'm covering everything up, aren't I, with my drawing? I'm drawing sloppily. So pre and post, and this is basically your hallux um, angle. Here's the angle of your uh, bunions. And we saw that before the running, here are our numbers. And then after you did the running for three months, we had a reduction in that angle. That's a good thing. It's not a lot. We didn't see a huge benefit from it, 
But in three months, with a condition that formed slowly over time due to many factors including footwear, biomechanics, environment, exercise, and genetics, would we really expect to completely fix it with three months of barefoot running? No way. So this is at least encouraging to me where I'm thinking, okay, now let's let's get some longer term studies and better data and see what, what is going on. This is enough for me personally to say, hey, this might be a, a thing that's worth trying out slowly. By the way, if you ease into barefoot um, running, a lot of people with five fingers, five fingers got sued a long time ago because people were getting foot injuries. They were buying barefoot running shoes and then they were going out and running, you know, a long distance like they they were used to and they didn't give their foot time to adapt and then they blamed the shoes for getting injured. If you change your footwear suddenly, you need to give it time to adapt and really slowly ease into the activity. Um, oh, by the way, here's a, uh, a little side note from the article. Uh, the increase of both intrinsic and extrinsic foot muscular strength, proprioception that's balance, uh, injury prevention has been shown already with minimalist shoes. So that's pretty cool. Um, now, the other thing that people talk about is spacers, is what about if we just physically like force the toe to change its angle? Well, yeah, it's gonna over time change the passive structures of the, the tissues. And you know, if you can deal with it, if this isn't too uncomfortable to wear spacers like this, or I've seen them where they're between you know each toe here, um, if you use that as part of a multifactorial solution, then that is potentially a good idea. So I pulled up a study, instead of just pulling up a study that looked at toe spacers alone, I wanted to look at a multifactorial approach. And so what I found here is foot mobilization, exercise, and toe separators. So this was a study. They followed up with a, um, a trial group, a clinical trial, they did a randomized control trial. And the intervention was essentially they did, well, what I just said, they did physical therapy where they were mobilized the joints um, they did you know they had the people wear toe separators and they did a bunch of strength exercises for the toes and the feet and what did they find well by the way side note um, conservative treatment uh, versus surgical treatment for bunions turns out there's actually, you know, a lot of, um, uh, it's, it's favorable and it's worth talking to your healthcare provider about, uh, especially if they're talking to you about surgery, you might want to get an opinion from a physical therapist or a sports chiropractor first. What were their conclusions? Well, um, essentially, uh, no surprise here that when you use exercise and you use the toe separators and you used a bunch of strength exercises, that we had improvements in your pain, your disability, your your actual measurements. They took x-rays of the toes and that improved as well as strength and range of motion after a year. So that's pretty cool. We ha improved a lot of stuff, um, basically function and pain and strength and all these things by using a combined method. So how do you actually fix your bunions? Well, according to the research that I was able to pull up, and by the way, when I make these videos, Videos, I do a lot of reading um, and I, I, I read a lot more articles than I present to you. I scan through uh, a bunch of articles and the ones that look junky, I just I, I scrap them because they're you know maybe bad studies or bad information or whatever. Um, or they're not relevant. So I do a lot of reading to make these videos for your benefit. So possible solutions. Well, according to the research, wearing minimal footwear with a wide toe box may not only help reduce the risk of forming bunions later in life, but even if you already have bunions, we actually may be able to reduce the amount um, uh, or severity of those bunions. Exercising, strengthening the feet, well, that kind of goes hand in hand with wearing minimal footwear, but if you do additional exercise and physical therapy, that can help. And uh, spacers can serve a role. I personally, I wouldn't go for the spacers, you know, unless you're also doing, you know, these items as well. So I don't think the spacers are gonna work on their own, um, as well as if you use them with you know, to reinforce the foot strengthening and function and uh, barefoot walking and uh, exercise and physical therapy. So I hope that helps. 
that is a general overview of, of bunions and, and some possible, you know, ideas of how we can, you know, maybe help with the, the pain and the, the function and all those things. Again, this is not healthcare advice. I am not yet a licensed uh, doctor. And so I cannot give you advice. And even if I were licensed, which I will be soon enough, I would never give you advice generically through a YouTube channel. I would want to meet with you individually, which means that your doctor wants to meet with you individually to discuss these things as well. Use this as fuel. Use this to form questions that you can then ask your trusted licensed healthcare professional. Um, I appreciate you watching. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and I will see you next time.